what, what, up, what up? What up? What up? What's up, my brother? What's up, man? You ready to talk about some last dance? Sure am. You know, uh, the last two episodes, we actually were wearing the same color. Um, the first one, we were wearing green. Uh, the second one, we were wearing black. I was just waiting to see what was, was going to happen this time. <laughs> Trying to see now, if you're going to get my mental. <laughs> huh? Hey, well, like you said, the first two episodes, it was just you and me. But we, but today we got three. Um, bringing on my brother, Stro Pinion. Stro from Stro Pinion is going to be joining us today. You got to check out his podcast, the Stro Pinion Podcast. Uh, the He's a walking NBA hoops encyclopedia. <laughs> and I'm, I'm excited to have his brother hanging out with us today, just kind of talking about uh, last dance life lessons, man. So let's let's just go ahead and dive in, people. Yes, sir. Cool. Stro, do you, you mind introducing yourself to the people? Well, I'm, you know, my friends, my name's Lehman, but my friends call me Stro. Uh, and uh, I've just always been very opinionated about basketball <laughs> and the such. And so I figured I'd start a podcast where my opinion is known and heard by everybody. Because I think my opinion matters. Yours do too, but mine does. <laughs> but a pleasure to have you. Pleasure to be here, fellas. I'm looking to dig in. A pleasure. Hey, hey, real quick, Stroll, let me kick a question to you, man, because a lot of people who are not into sports, when they see people who love sports arguing, getting passionate and treating these debates like it just matters a whole lot. A lot of those people feel like, come on, guys, it's just a game. But for guys like us, this game has so much meaning and the discussions are worth it. What is your case for the value of philosophizing about sports? to the people out there who just don't get it? I mean, I don't even know if a case can be made. It just seems like that, you know, it's just a part of my life. Listen, I got, you know, I grew up with five brothers and two sisters. And, you know, I, I never, I was just talking to my wife the other day, like, I can't imagine in my childhood or can, cannot remember a time when I wasn't playing football, wasn't playing um, baseball or softball or basketball sports just seem to be like a part of like my life and so when I met anybody that had nothing to do with sports like I'm like you don't play basketball you don't you don't play football you don't wrestle you don't do something uh, so sports is just to me almost like religion man I, I don't you know I don't know life without it and so yeah. I'm what I'm so passionate about it and so whenever discussions come up in that kind of way and people look at me because man i do i i man i get heated <laughs> at times of when i'm trying to get my point across but it's just because i'm just so passionate about sports and what sports means not only to me my family but it seems like what it means to my culture um and how i grew up and it's just it's just always been there and without it you know just like now without it it's just like amazingly there's some seems like there's something missing in my life right now when I'm not watching sports on television. Yeah, I think for a lot of us who grew up with sports, whether we went into it intending it for it to for it to be this way or not, it's like that's how we learn leadership. That's how we learn to deal with the unfairness of life, right? Because sometimes right. you lose a game because you're not good enough, but sometimes you should have won the game. You did everything right, and the ref made a bad call, or somebody committed an error, somebody cheated. And that's life, man. You, you just got to learn how to cope with those types of things. And for a lot of us who come up like that, sports is where we learn most of the, the insights and lessons that help us get through life as adults, you know? Yes. It's like, I mean, like, uh, knowing what your role is, what your part is in a sport, like, and you, you have to find that responsibility, own that responsibility and do it. And it's just like in life, like when you, when you, find where you belong it's up to you to do what you're supposed to do within that belongness that makes the whole work and so sports yeah. has always done that for me mm. yeah 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 we, I, I like we, that we were man. talking about that we were talking about that quite a bit with uh last episode with um dennis rodman and and the way that you know he took things that people didn't necessarily enjoy in rebounding in, in playing just hardcore defense, and he did his job, and he did it daggone well. Um, he 
you know, night in, night out. He wasn't worried about scoring. He wasn't worried about passing. He was worried about doing what needed to be done to make the team great and to make the team win. And that that manifested in the form of rebound. And he dominated it. He knew his job and he did it better than anybody else. Um, and I think nowadays a lot of people, you know, they get so caught up in trying to be everything for everybody and and, and forget forget that role and forget the job um, and their ability to do it well and, and why that matters. Absolutely. One of the things that Dennis said um, when he was talking about rebounding, how he um, studied and, you know, watched where a ball would come off the rim and knowing what, knowing to be. And, and I've never, you know, heard that said about somebody rebounding the basketball. I thought it was just all about being able to jump off the floor quicker than anybody else. But him studying the ball, hitting the rim, and knowing um, where particular angles where the ball would come and how he put himself in that position to be not only one of the best defenders ever, but to be arguably at his size, the best rebounder the game has ever seen because he made it an art. Hmm. Hey, and to your point, he was naming specific players. At one point, he was like, yeah. when Larry Bird shot the ball, it tended to spin <laughs> like this. When Magic shot, it would right. go like this. I was like, man, that's some serious research right there. Yeah. Bananas. It's and it's well, like he, without, it's like. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Now I was gonna say it's like you know, um, taking something like watching other rebounders trying to imitate the other rebounders, but then taking rebounding like uh, TK just said, and knowing that a guy's gonna shoot and the way he shoots and the way the ball rotates, as I think Dennis put it cause the ball to, you know, angle off here, come off the back iron this way, and not just jumping for the ball, but positioning himself, understanding where the basketball will come from, where it will go, rather. And that was crazy to me, too. Well, cool. Without further ado, um, let's uh, let's dive into some of these topics. I, I, I know we got a lot to cover. Um, a lot happened in episode uh, five and six. Um, I'm just going to go down the, the list real quick and and give a brief uh, overview, and then we'll dive right in, fellas, and uh, just pick it apart and, and see what life lessons we could pull out. So episode five starts out with um, us getting a, a cameo appearance from Kobe and, and him talking about his relationship with Michael Jordan um, and, and everything that Michael did for him and everything that Michael, Michael Jordan's game did for Kobe Bryant um, and how much inspiration he was able to pull from that. From that, we segue into Jordan's shoe deal. And, you know, we understand uh, Jordan's and this, how they've become these cultural phenomenon, but you, this is really where it started. And, and that entire process where Jordan was trying to decide which company he would go with and, and what that eventually blossomed into. Episode number five closes out with us, you know, covering the dream team and um, just the battles that they had and how before the dream team, professional players couldn't even play in the Olympics. And just the battles that they had, especially during those earlier years. And what we come to find out was that one of the players that they played against and they were going at was actually um, somebody who then got on their team and helped them win championships. Episode six, we go straight to Michael Jordan in his hotel room where he's talking about um, just how much pressure he's under, being under the spotlight, always on, and and in this whole Be Like Mike campaign, being this role model. Um, and then, then you know, we, we're shown the inverse of him being uh, a gambler and, 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 and you know, ex having to explain that to the media and having to wrestle with this harsh reality that he's not a perfect man, he's not a perfect person, that he is flawed, and and that's okay. And I think that you know him having to go through those battles with the media uh, is just is is just a great opportunity to dive into all those you know good questions about you know what does it mean to be a role model, and that's probably where we're going to close it out. So, you know, uh, the floor is open. Either one of you guys want to jump in, and um, yeah, let's kick it off with this Michael Jordan and Kobe. Uh, cameo appearance. Yeah. Astro, I really love the video you made, man, called uh, I'm Really Gonna Miss Kobe. 
And I, I, I think I know he's a guy who's pretty near and dear to your heart. And you've said a lot of great things about him. Um, I, I love to hear you kick this off, man. Well, um, when Kobe, when Kobe first started playing basketball and I was one of his one of his fans and in my circle, that wasn't popular because, you know, growing up in Chicago, you know, it was a it was a Michael Jordan town. And one of the a lot of the criticisms that Kobe got was that he's just trying to be like Michael Jordan. And I, and I was always like, well, if you if you have the ability to be like the greatest, you should be like the greatest. And I think him coming on and and uh, talking about it. First of all, I was I was touched because, you know, because of the tragedy. Then I was you know, one of the things that he says is that what you get from me is from him. I don't get five championships without him because he's guided me so much and gave me so much great advice. And I thought him saying that um, should have pointed to how powerful it is to have a good mentor, you know, and somebody that that you see that uh, looks like you feel, you know what I mean? And and you get an opportunity to, to, to go and be around this guy and he's gracious enough to give you tips and pointers about being a points rather about being the greatest and what it's going to take to be who I am. So I, I dug it and I, I was so, so happy to see Kobe doing that. Cause like growing up, you know, guys would be like, you know, Kobe, he'll never say it. He'll never say that he's trying to be like Mike. And, and I, I really defended Kobe Bryant for years uh, by saying like, if you can't be, if you can be like the greatest, then why not? So I, I was, I was first of all like, super excited about it, but I knew it was coming. I, I knew it was coming when Kobe Bryant before the All Star Game. I think it was, yeah. He played Michael Jordan in the in the uh, United Center, and I was telling one of my brothers at the time, I was like, "Man, this guy is gonna be something." And my brother at the time told me, "No, he's not. He's just he's just an <laughs> imitation of him." But it proved to be that he he ended up being. Uh, one of the greatest we've ever seen and one of the greatest we'll ever talk about. Yeah, man. You know, it's so funny that this was the main criticism of Kobe early on in his career, that he was trying to be like Mike. And I never understood that criticism because me and all the people that were making the criticism, that's who we wanted to be when we was kids. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like for me, Kobe represents the child in all of us that aspires to greatness, right? And- right. One of the cool things about this whole next MJ debate is we saw so many contenders and pretenders come and go. I remember when Harold Miner, they were ready to crown him. He had the ball head. You know, they're ready to crown Tell Harold Miner at the next MJ. Um, Stackhouse got the, tr the next MJ treatment. He was from UNC. There were so many people like that. And when it came time to just like, you know, achieve under pressure, they 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 couldn't rise to that. And Kobe was that dude that was very clear, I want to be the GOAT. And he had he went after it and he just kept rising to the occasion. I remember for me, my my Kobe moment was I think they were playing a Utah Jazz. And I, I believe if I, if my memory serves me correctly that Dale Harris was the coach at that time of, of the Lakers. And um it, it was in the clutch and it was an important shot and the play was ran for Kobe and he shot that air ball. And down the stretch, Kobe shot four air balls, but he kept taking the alpha <laughs> shot. <laughs> and no point did, did it occur to Kobe, maybe I should just let somebody else be that dude. Kobe was like, no, we're going to win or lose with me taking that alpha shot. And when I saw that, I said to myself, man, this dude's got it. This dude's got something special, man. Um, he's got that Mike swag. And and years later, he gave advice to, uh, um, ironically, the uh, Utah Jazz point guard, Darren Williams. I, I guess Darren Williams had some kind of game where he was like, I, I want to say like 0 for 16. And uh, and Kobe said, no, no, he was like 0 for 9. And Kobe said, you should never go 0 for 9. It's better to go 0 for 30 than 0 for 9. Because the fact that you went 0 for 9, it means that you defeated yourself. Because at some point, right. you lost confidence. You stopped shooting. He was like, next time, go over 30. And that, that was that Kobe mindset that it just commanded my respect, man. I don't care he was trying to be like Mike. It's like he actually did it. You know what I mean? One of the things that I found interesting um, 
from that cut scene is that it showed Michael Jordan with the Eastern All-Star players and they were in a huddle and they were all kind of just joking like, oh, I'm like he thinks he's about to guard me. Like he don't even know what's coming. And um, they one of the one of the teammates was saying to Jordan, like, man, th- th- this Laker boy, like this kid from the Lakers, he doesn't let the game come to him. He takes it. He just takes it. He's not waiting for it. He's not going to let the you know that motion come. He's going to take it and he's going to come at you. Um, what do you guys think of that? Like, what do you think about, you know, is that true? Does does Kobe take the game? Does does that Mamba mentality, um, is it not as fluid as, you know, some would like it? Is it more just dominating or, you know, you in that? I thought, you know, first of all, it was Michael Jordan that said it. And I thought that was ironic when he, he didn't think of his young self um, playing the exact same way. Uh, when he was younger in, in the early 84, 85, you know, under Doug Collins, that's the way Michael Jordan played basketball. He did not let the game come to him, in my opinion. He he went out and took it. And I think that uh, Michael Jordan, amongst his basketball peers, I think he was trying to fill them out because I think at that point, Michael Jordan knew who Kobe was. He saw a lot of himself in Kobe. And Michael Jordan learned – uh, to play the game the way he ended up playing the game, learning how to be an assassin within uh, within the scheme, you know. And Kobe Bryant, he had that assassin mentality all the time. And so him being a young guy, he knew what the stage was. And it's like TK just said, and he didn't shy away from the stage. He would say stuff like, excuse me, he would say stuff like, this is fun. And so he went out and then I think that that was the beginning or the alpha of what we learned to be the mama mentality later on. It's like that I'm going to take it. And then he matured and matured and matured in the game. He learned to play the game like that. But I think it has to start with that uh, fearlessness about I'm not afraid of the moment. If, and if that's me going one-on-one with you in an all-star game when all the best players of the world are here together, and I'm going to show you that I'm, I'm, I'm young, I'm 19, but I'm not afraid, so I will play one-on-one. And that developed into what we saw later as an absolute destroyer of defenders. Yeah, you know, one of the things I think is captured by that is nobody's going to give you permission to be great. You know, people may or may not get out of the way when you decide I'm going to be great, but nobody's going to call you up from the back and be like, hey, man, uh, I think you might be great. Why don't you just step up and, and be the man? Nobody's going to do that. You know, if you want to be great, then you the, you're the one that has to see your own potential. You're the one that has to believe in yourself. Does it help to have mentors and leaders in our lives who can say, I believe in you? It absolutely helps to have that. And I believe that everybody's got at least one person in their lives who who might speak encouraging words to them. But at the end of the day, no matter how many people you got around you encouraging you, when it comes to to that next level of greatness that Kobe wanted to have, nobody's going to give you permission to do that. You know, not even Michael Jordan, your hero, is going to give you permission to do that. Like, you have to step up and just dare to take it and then see what happens, you know. And, and I think that illustrates the importance of being willing to bet on yourself and being bigger than the than even the positive expectations that other people have for you. Yeah, I think one of the things that, I think Kobe was was just really great at is that if he didn't know the answer to something, he wasn't afraid to ask. He wasn't afraid to try. He wasn't afraid to gamble his in his embarrassment. He didn't care about the perception whether you know th- these people agreed with him or these people agreed. You know, he trusted the process and he just followed his intuition. Like if I need to do this, I'm gonna go 110. percent I'm not gonna you know ask. I'm not gonna wait. Um, I'm just going to try or I'm just going to do. And I think, you know, that ability just to to trust your instincts, to trust that mentality, to trust your mindset, to trust all the practice you've put in leads to these big moments where you get to play Michael Jordan one on one, where you get to show him what you're working with um, and you get, to, you know, t- to pull that 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 fade away. So I, I can't just say enough about how much, you know, that that impacted me just not being afraid of that embarrassment, not being af- afraid to try and to look like a fool, but also, you know, the upside of that where you look like the star and 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 you get that praise. 
Yeah, 100%, man. Your 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 other one was uh, I'm trying I'm forgetting it was a uh, shoe deal right? Yeah yeah it was the shoe deal and essentially um, I think the what what was it crazy about this is that Michael Jordan didn't even want to talk to Nike Nike was the upstart Nike was um, the new guys on the block all all the guys in the the in the in the NBA at that time you know the Magic Johnsons the Larry Birds the icons of that era were with Converse. And essentially Jordan's agent was like, look, I don't think you're going to get any, any, you know, exposure if you go on to Converse. I don't think they're going to take you serious. I think you're going to be, you're going to sit in the back of the bus. And Jordan was like, okay, well, that makes sense. How about Adidas? Adidas, I really like Adidas. Let's go with them. Adidas, I think, missed out on a big opportunity and would love to hear you guys weigh in on that. But essentially... Jordan's agent ended up having to call Michael Jordan's parents just to get him on a plane to go talk to Nike. And what that resulted in was they came to a deal. And I think the projections that they gave Jordan and his agent was after the after four years of this contract, we're expected to sell three million shoes um, total. And well, I think it was $3 million in revenue, sorry. And what ended up happening was after the first year of the deal, they sold $120 million in shoes. And I think from that point, you know, as, as the screen is playing, but Jordan was a cultural icon that an, an athlete, a, I don't think a professional basketball player at that time was ever able to do, where he led the country, where he led hip hop culture where he that that just led the movement to basketball shoes and he didn't in such an iconic way with the Jordan brand. Yeah, uh, uh, a couple of things about that. It's like I remember it. I mean, I was 10 or 11 years old when all this stuff was unfolding. But one of the things that 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 stuck out to me is like him not wanting to go to Nike, but his dad uh, and his mom encouraging him, and then his dad telling him, "You'll be a fool not to take this deal." Right. Uh, another thing was like when Rod Thorne was asking uh, David Fall, "What are you trying to get this guy to be a tennis player?" Because guys at that time, team sports was about team, so they it wasn't a mark it wasn't marketing toward a, pulling a guy from a team sport and like making him the guy. And so Michael Jordan did that. He had everything that it needed to be, of course. You know, he was he was an incredible basketball player. He had the charisma. He had the look and all of that. And and what eventually happened is is just what they said. It changed the game all the way. Like guys went and bought gym shoes to go play in a gym, not to wear them as fashion. And it turned into that. I remember being in eighth grade and I was uh, it was like 88 and. I had a friend, his name was Clarence Williams. He was about 6'3". And we would always mimic the Mars Blackman commercials where I would stand on his shoulders and 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 he would leave me hanging there. But that's the way it impacted. And I remember like uh, growing up and people actually getting robbed for their Air Jordans, you know what I mean? Like it, it, was, it was such a big deal to have a pair of sneakers um, that Michael, you know, these Jordans. And I was, I mean, I was, I knew that it was big, but $126 million in the first year, like 1984, 85, that's, that's a lot of money in 1985. And I just, I just thought that them bringing that out was pretty amazing. But Michael Jordan was that guy, that, that sort of, that sort of first move, um, the Air Jordan, for them to name a shoe after him, for that to be a demand of his, um, was so important to where we are now as far as uh, shoes are concerned. I really like your observation about how that was the thing that that set the stage for this idea of, of like the standout superstar, because prior to that, it was just about teams, right? Like your whole team were Converse, we marketed teams. And, and even when Jordan first came to the league, even though he was doing a lot of amazing stuff and everybody felt he was the best individual talent, they weren't saying he was the GOAT. 
because they would say, yeah, he's a great individual talent, but Magic and Larry, they they win as a team. And, and so the monkey hanging on Jordan's back the whole time was to distinguish himself from Larry and Magic, overcome that criticism by getting championships and so forth. So when we fast forward to the day and we listen to these GOAT debates, like, is it Jordan or is it LeBron? It's like, we don't appreciate how that's a debate that Jordan himself created. The fact that we're having right. that debate reinforces a cultural movement that Jordan caused because prior to him, we didn't have that kind of debate. You know, you had guys like Will Chamberlain and Bill Russell who were considered greats, but you talked about great teams. And the debate was about, are the Celtics or the Lakers the best franchise? You know, that's the kind of debate that you had. And Michael, that was just one of many moves he made that just had a ripple effect that changed the way we even talk about basketball today that we just we just take for granted. And, and, I, and I think sometimes he gets dismissed as a guy that wasn't involved in culture because of the whole Republicans buy sneakers too. And, and we can talk about more, more of that later with the role model part. But I, I think what he doesn't get enough credit for is the way he impacted culture when it came to art, when it came to entrepreneurship, when it came to creativity. Michael was that dude that made it possible for all these black people now to be able to design their own shoes, have fashion companies, all, all of our black celebrities and artists and athletes. We, we just think it's normal for Kanye to do this. We just think it's normal for LeBron to have all these multimedia companies and so forth. That that wasn't what, you know, Jim Brown was doing. You know, Jim Brown right. did a heck of a lot socially and politically but Jim Brown is not the guy that paved the way for black athletes to be running businesses like this. MJ was the guy who paved that way. And I think that's something that he doesn't get enough credit for. I mean, I, I agree. I, mean, I think it really, to Iron's, um point, I think it depends who you are, what, what hood you're in, in the, in the States, but People definitely still get robbed for the Jordans today. Like it, it's 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 a common occurrence. Like it and it, I think to this day it's just revolutionized culture, and and it's built it. Like people, Jordan led the paved the way in so many ways for for what modern day sneaker culture is today. Like the, the whole business of being a sneakerhead, of being a soul collector, of of having eBay stores, of having you know. All these different these these businesses really started from this brand in the way it was able to infiltrate culture. Oh yeah, one hundred percent, man, one hundred percent. What, what what's your uh, I I I know that that you be getting on me about time, so which, let, let's move on to that next one. But I'm not holding it in my head very well. For sure, I, I think you know this. It's actually a good way. This this be like Mike campaign. Um, where, you know, he was under the spotlight. And I, I'd, I'd love to just hear you guys kind of talk about it because y'all lived during that era where Be Like Mike was a real thing. To me, it's a gimmick and and I, and I hear it, but I don't even know what that really means. <laughs> but, but, well, first of all, uh, it's not a gimmick, young man. <laughs> I mean, it, it was, I'm being funny, but it was a real thing, like... Whoever came up with this Be Like Mike slogan, um, especially if you were a Chicago kid, um, it meant a lot to us. You know, we had something to grab onto. And it's like TK talked about earlier, man, you really wanted to be like Mike in every way. Like you, you wanted to be like him because he was the best basketball player. He was on your team. But then also, you know, he had his own gym shoe. He had this this swag at the time that seemed to be unmatched. He seemed to fear nothing, you know, and he was unapologetically himself. And like when you are a young black boy and you see all of this power that this guy's walking in and, you know, he's walking in his own brand. I mean, it's, his shoe is not, you know, you're not even saying Nikes anymore. You're saying Jordans. I mean, that's your name. And so when you when you see things like that and you're like, I want to be like Mike. And in this way, and the way I did it, I was like, I want to be like Mike and that he's being himself. 
I want to be like Stro. I want to be like who I am and do everything like I want to do it. And however it falls, whatever comes after it is what it is. But that campaign for me personally made me want to be like myself, not just, you know, be like Mike in the way that he was himself, turn it to be being like me, like I wanted. Yep, and, and and you know I I want to I want to bring it back too as well to um, you know what it means to me what what it meant to me as as a young black dude coming up I think again the whole I, I I guess I'm getting into the whole role model thing and the whole cultural impact thing but another thing that Mike doesn't get a whole lot of credit for is when he came into the league and you were a black man who had the the privilege of of making good money to be able to play basketball for a living. You you just kind of did your job, man. But you didn't really you didn't really bring heat and speak truth to power, right? And I'm I'm hard pressed to find an athlete before Jordan who would do things like criticize the general manager of the team publicly, mm -hmm. disagree with his basketball decisions openly, disagree with his coaching and hiring decisions openly. Jordan did that consistently. And, and you can disagree with Jordan's logic and say, well, he should have handled it this way, or you know, I, I disagree with his opinion here. But, jo but to me, be like Mike meant, you're not just there to shut up and dribble, right? It's okay for you to be a leader on and off the court. It's okay for you to have an opinion and speak up without being afraid of what Jerry Crawls or Jerry Reinsdorf is gonna do to you because you got an opinion that you feel passionate about. I mean, even when we saw with the Dream Team, where you know they had, you know, they had those Reebok uniforms, and yeah. people say, people dismiss that by being like, "Oh, that's just because he had an endorsement with Nike." But that's 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 way too quick of a dismissal because Reebok had a lot of money on the line. Reebok paid a lot, and they put a lot of pressure. and And the actual threat was you don't get to go and have a gold medal if you don't walk out with that, okay? And we don't know if they're gonna sue you or what they're gonna do. You don't know what's gonna happen. And Jordan is talking like, well, they got a surprise coming. They got a surprise coming because I know I'm gonna do what I wanna do. I'm, I'm not gonna walk out there and let anybody see me with a Reebok uniform on. It's just not happening. And I'm not gonna have a board meeting to see what the best way to work it out is. I'm, I got my own ideas and I'm not telling anybody. And the guy walks out with a flag. And you can hear one of the commentators being like, I'm not exactly sure if this is uh, pure patriotism here. You know, but it was just so funny seeing the combination of boldness and creativity. And to me, be like Mike means don't just be great at what you do, but be bold enough to be who you really are all the way and speak truth. And I think... That might have been for me one of the first brothers I saw in the public eye be that loved by that many people with that much to lose. Be like, yeah, I disagree with my GM. Yeah, I disagree with Reebok. I'm doing things my way. And I, I, that's inspiring, man. Yeah, I, I think it absolutely is. I think, you know, on the other side of, of, of just that exposure that he had was him having to deal with it, like him having to always be on, him having to always be this icon, always be this role model, always be this public figure. And I think, you know, this goes across the board with all celebrities, right? Um, I think Michael Jordan was the celebrity of celebrities, though. He was the biggest athlete on the planet at that time. And with that comes just that responsibility to, 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 to not at least in the public eye, be off, right? To always be that role model because kids are always watching you because everybody wants to be like Mike. And I think, you know, when we got some of this behind the scenes footage, we could see how how tired he was from being that. And in and, and some of these uh, interviews, you heard him say, I think people think they want to be like Mike. And I think, you know, they love, they, they tell me, I, I'd love to be like Mike for a day. I'd love to be like Mike for a week. And his response was, try being like Mike for a year. You know, try try walking in these shoes for a year. Um, and I think that's an entirely different ballgame where, where it, it just requires you to be this figure all the time. And I, and I think this, you know, is a good segue to our next point, which is, 
you know, all this positive attention, you know, they were, they were, they had so much good um, media around, you know, him being this, this influential figure, this respectable athlete that I think eventually people wanted to know what was the other side of Michael Jordan, you know, what was the side that wasn't talked about as much. And after Sam Smith's book, um, what was the name of it? The Jordan Rules. And it talked about, you know, some of the not so pretty sides of Michael Jordan, like how, how, com how much of a competitor he was and what that really looked like, you know, behind closed doors in practices where he's coming at his teammates and selling and, 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 and just giving it to them, you know, letting them know that what you think is good and what I think is good is two different levels, man, and that you're going to need to step it up. And of course it wasn't phrased that way. Of course it, 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 it came off a lot harsher, but that was the essence. And I think, you know, there's this concept of locker room talk that, that kind of just stays in the locker room. And then, the other side that you, you know, talk to the media and the public, but when the two worlds get collided, I think a lot of people who aren't athletes and who, you know, who haven't had to compete at that level, see the kinds of behavior that it takes and, and just, and it doesn't sit well with them. And I think, you know, in addition to that and his gambling, it, you know, it, things kind of started to crumble, at least that's what it seemed like in terms of this public perception of this perfect man um, and this be like Mike campaign. Yeah, I think that uh, I think that in those times, like Michael Jordan was like the epitome of image consciousness. Like he was so conscious of his image and how he was perceived by the public because it meant a lot to his brand. And and so I think where he tried to be this elite athlete, he also brought it over into like his image and what he was trying to make sure was portrayed. And so when Sam Smith com comes out with this book and all of these negative things are coming out uh, about it, I think, I think it rattled him, you know, a bit, uh, especially the gambling thing. I, I think that really rattled him and you saw it, uh, you know, when, when he was having the interview with the Rashad or whatever, and, you know, he has like the, 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 the shades on and like the, you know, the tonation of his voice, I had, uh, and I remember watching that interview, and I, I remember saying, like, I've never seen Mike, Mike seem like he was so afraid that, like, something was going to happen, but it was just because, like, these moments that you perceive as private, like, if you are an mm -hmm. athlete, like, if you grew up like we did, like, what we, what we said in the locker room, what we said amongst each other, what we said on the bus coming from game to game, that was this, like, unspoken rule that this, this just stays in here. And so when that when those kind of things came out, like Sam Smith, he's having these conversations with people who were privy to these conversations. And then Mike, Michael Jordan, this this icon, I mean, because at this point, like he is the absolute man and everything about him seems to be right. And everybody wants to be that dude. Um, but when it when it comes out that like, man, I'm you know, I got some stuff going on, too. Like, I'm this guy in practice. I'm, you know, I do gamble a little bit. And then when someone takes this narrative of taking what, what we looked at as a pristine person um, and, and there's some tarnish to it, I think that he was rattled by it and he tried to handle it in the best way because I think, like, his image at that point was uh, paramount to him because it meant so much for his brand because at that point, this is where like all of his money is really coming from. He's getting paid by these companies more than he is for playing basketball. And, uh, and I think, again, I think that rattled him and I think it came out in some of the interviews and when, when guys like even myself thought like, you know, Mike is a perfect guy, you know, as a teenager, 14, 15 year old kid, you're like, man, Mike, Mike is perfect. And then this comes out. I think that rattled him. So speaks to how important it is to keep in mind when people are praising you and celebrating you that that's that's not unconditional love, you know. Um, when when people you know maybe everybody praises you for the job you do at work. Okay, well that's what you do for a paycheck. That's not unconditional love. That's not loyalty. That's admiration for the particular gift that you can display in a very particular context. And sometimes when you're accustomed to being praised, 
to being respected, to being looked up to, you can forget how quickly people will be willing to throw you under the bus and drop you so fast if it means that they can get a quick paycheck, if it means they can get a moment in the spotlight. And you can look at that as pessimistic and be like, whoa, man, I thought this was life lessons. This sounds pretty pessimistic. But I think being both healthy and successful requires you to not be naive about life, you know, and to, to remember the distinction between people you have in your corner because they know you, they trust you, and they respect the real you. They know about all your flaws and they love you anyway versus the people that are at the periphery of your life who love on you because, you know, it's it's cool to be seen with you. It's cool, uh, you know, to roll in your entourage. And I think it's a, it's a good lesson in that. Uh, one of the things that made me laugh is you mentioned the, the the Jordan Rules book, but then there was another guy who had a book. It was a picture of him and Jordan on the cover, and it was called like My Gambling Addiction with Michael. <laughs> and I'm like, man, hold up. You got a gambling addiction. You're ready to, to come free and talk about that. Just talk about my gambling addiction. But no, he had to put Jordan on the poster, on the cover, and then say my gambling addiction with, I mean, if I wanted to come out for a gambling addiction, that would be like me being like, my gambling addiction with Kamal, not telling you, just putting your picture on the cover. It's like, why drag me under the bus? But I'll tell you why. It sells more books, man. You know, you've worked yeah. very hard to make a name for yourself. And if I can put your name on my book, even though it makes you look bad, it makes me a little bit richer. And that's the harsh reality, man, that, that people will do those kinds of things to you. And I think Mike, just like we all need to, learned a very valuable lesson about, about where real loyalty is. And I think those experiences made him closer to his family, it made him closer to his friends, and it made him smarter. Because at that point, Michael let more people into his circle and he started to get a little bit more selective and discerning. And you know, that was kind of a wake up call for him. If I could just if I could just chime right back in just for a moment, Michael did like he said, like, you know, I was gambling and you know, you go play golf and then you're starting to see guys come in that you 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 play with them, but you don't really know them. And and it's funny that you said that, TK. I thought the same thing when I'm when I was watching it, like, like this guy just took an opportunity to capitalize on a few games of golf that he and Mike were just crossing. They were just playing golf. He, he, you know, Mike didn't confide in him about like, I have a problem too, but he took that opportunity. And I think what Mike did from that was to see like, I have to be more selective in who I let all the way in my circle and who I'm vulnerable around. Then that's, that is a life lesson. You have to be real careful about people that are in your circle who know you, who you let to, um, let's see certain things about you because if you're not, if they aren't trustworthy, they will expose you or exploit you. Yep. There's one last aspect that I wanted to talk about. Um, and, and this is actually a, a factor fiction kind of discussion. So, um, you know, this is completely um, up to you guys to kind of discern uh, where y'all stand on this. But one of the things that Scotty Pippen said is that the public has an appetite for these rise and fall narratives. Is that a fact or is that fiction? I'll go first. Uh, I'm going to say fact. I, I agree with Scotty. Yeah. I'm, you want I'm me to expound? Or... <laughs> Please. Yeah. No, I, I'd, lo I'd, I'd love you to expound. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I, I think heroes inspire us and they intimidate us at the same time. You know, when, when someone rises above the average and they do uncommon things, it, it kind of opens a window in our own minds to, to kind of see what the possibilities are for our lives. You know, um, other people's greatness has a way of making you think about, all right, Where's your life going? How are you spending your time? What are you up to? I, I remember when I used to I used to work at Applebee's, and uh, you know I was I was a server at the restaurant, and you know every once in a while somebody would they would leave the job because they get some kind of better opportunity, and you were always happy for them, but then it kind of made you assess your life and be like, wait a minute, what am I doing? You know, like like where am I headed? Is this where I want to be? Because whenever people move up or move out into greatness, it just kind of make you 
reassess your life. And, that, and, and that can be inspiring, but that can also be intimidating. Uh, it, it can make you feel jealous. It can make you start looking for excuses so that you don't feel so bad about all the different ways you're not getting after it. And so I think that expresses itself in a tendency to pull people down once they achieve a certain level. Why? Because it's much easier to bring great people down to the level that we're already at than it is to push ourselves to rise to the level where they are. You know, if, if, um, if, if, if you go out there and you make big things happen, it's just much easier for me to like search for a scandal and find something about you. Then I could be like, ha ha ha, I brought him down to my level. He ain't nothing special. He ain't nobody. You know, he's a person just like me. Then it is for me to push myself to, um, to be inspired by that person to see if I've got possibilities in my life that I'm not exploring. So I think we see it in the cycle of gossip, right? We, we build people up and we tear them down and there is an entire, there, there's an economy that's built around this. You know, so like if you look out in, in LA, for instance, and TMZ culture and, and gossip culture, page six culture, whatever it's called, there are people who get paid. They get paid to capture celebrities in compromising moments. So if you walk walking down the street in LA and you see a couple of famous actors that have good reputations and, and maybe they're, they're somewhere where they shouldn't be, a place that would be deemed scandalous by most people. If you get a picture of that, you can turn around and sell that to the tabloids and make a nice chunk of change. And so it's to the point where we economically incentivize people to tear to tear heroes down. That, that, that doesn't make me feel like I no longer want to live in my world. That doesn't make me feel like all is hopeless or it's not worth the effort to be in a hero. But I absolutely do believe that it's a fact that people like the rise and fall narrative. The same people who quickly build you up will have no problem tearing you down if there's a profit for them. Just like that dude who wrote that book, My Gambling Addiction, not with myself, <laughs> but with Mike. <laughs> Absolutely. I, mean, uh, I I agree all the way. I think, I think the same way. I think we like to uh, watch people rise and we, we're their fans and we get caught up in it, but we also like to see them I mean, and it's bad, but we like to see them fall because now we feel like, hey, now we're on the same page. They, they, you know, and as crazy as it is, it's as long as I've been living, it's always been that way. Like, and so I, I just, I agree with Scotty. Yeah, I, I think, um, I, I think what's, what's unfortunate about this whole rise and fall narrative is that things that aren't even um, really a fall, like, you know, gambling, I, I think that was another one of my questions. Is it even inherently bad? I think, you know, people are all across the spectrum on this, but I think there's things that, that, you know, the common folks do that are just, are not acceptable for people like Michael Jordan or for people like LeBron James or for people like, you know, Anthony Davis, um, they're just not given that same kind of leeway, that same kind of um, acceptedness that you're allowed to to have off days and you're expected to be on all the time. And I think what we've seen with the new generation of players is that they're a lot more defensive and protective and 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 controlling of their own narrative. Um, whereas, you know, in the 80s and the 90s and even previous to that, that the media controlled a, a lot of that. And, and I think, yeah, I mean, I, of course I agree with you guys that it, it's absolutely a fact, but I think, you know, we've seen this change that through the power of digital media, social media and the like, um, you know, the players have really taken their narratives into their own hands. And, um, and yeah, I think that's been a game changer. TK, do you want to wrap us up with uh, final shots? Everybody kind of go around, give one big takeaway from the two episodes, their big life lesson. Oh, man. Um, yeah, I, I think maybe my maybe my big takeaway um, from, from the things that we discussed is that um, at the end of the day, you got to define who you want to be in the world based on your principles, your preferences, and your priorities. And then you got to live that without apology. And you got to understand that there's always going to be somebody 
that's got a problem with that. Um, there's just no such thing as some neutral ground you can stand on in life that's going to make everybody be like, yeah, he's our guy. Because even if you do find a neutral ground, it's going to be people who get mad at you for not being neutral. I mean, for being neutral. It's going to be people who get mad at you for saying, you know that our side is the right one and, and that this is the one you should be taking a stand for. And they'll criticize you for that. So don't prioritize your choices in life based on what you think is going to produce the least amount of struggle or the least amount of criticism. Prioritize your decisions based on what you feel called to do and what makes you come alive. And to me, that's what it means to be like Mike. Yeah, I agree. One of the things that Michael, one of the things that Mike said was that uh, he said my game was my biggest endorsement, and so he understood that, like, everything that he did was making sure that he was successful and the best player on the basketball floor because because of what he did on the basketball floor, it made him who he is. And so him knowing that he was put here obviously to play basketball. So what I'm going to do is cultivate and be as skilled as I can at what I'm here to do. And if I do that, I'll get a lot of benefit from it. So the same thing with me, I figure out what I'm here to do and I cultivate those things to make sure I'm very good at what I'm here to do. And when I do that, I benefit from it and those that are around me benefit from me being all in so I can be like Stro. Mm. Be like Stro, that's dope. I, I think for myself, um, what what was just really apparent from, from episode five and six is that Michael Jordan um, really set, set the path for a lot of us to walk behind him. Um, I think, you know, really trailblazed a lot of the past that we see athletes, that we see entrepreneurs, that we see cultural icons walk behind. And, you know, to TK's point earlier, I, I don't think he gets the credit that he deserves. I think he was able as a touch different avenues um, and, and just shifted the culture in such a powerful way, ways that are seen and ways that are unseen. And I think, you know, through the experience of this documentary and, and just the behind the scenes footage, you really realize how much of the things that, you know, we might be into, the things that we consume are, have been influenced by his career and um, what he brought to the game. Hey man, 100 facts for sure. Hey, Stro, tell the people where to find you, man. I know we got your, uh, got your Twitter handle up there, but tell the people where to find you if they want to listen to you talk more about hoops. Okay, well you could, you know, of course you can find me on Twitter at Stropinion. Um, also you can find, I have a YouTube page, uh, it is the same thing, Stropinion, uh, and where you where you find podcasts. So it's Stropinion. And again, it's where all opinions matter. So check me out. Uh, <laughs> your opinion matters to you. Mine, mine, mine matters to me. So you can find a lot of, lot of stuff on uh, my, my YouTube page, Stropinion. Yeah. And, 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 you know, j just as we wrap up here, we, we have two minutes on, on here and I know we did our final word, but, but, but you've talked a lot about how my opinion matters and your opinion matters more, uh, how my opinion matters and your opinions matter. Um, you give us the final opinion on, um, what, what last dance means to you. Well, well, last, last dance means everything to me because Michael Jordan has always been so private and me being like the one of the biggest fans of Michael Jordan and being able to dig in and to see like what it was to be Michael Jordan without all of the uh, the put on for lack of a better phrase and to be able to get behind the scenes and see him. Um, I was thinking about it as I was watching it, the, watching the last one that he just he was a regular basketball player. And if you play ball and you've been around teams, you see that's how guys act. And the best player on the team, that's how he acted. So um, I'm, I'm super, super hyped about this. And my, my wife asked me, what am I going to do when it's over? And I don't know. <laughs> I know, man. I wish this thing would go for 20 seasons. There, there are just so many, uh, so many beautiful moments that 
we uh we we couldn't go into detail on that they couldn't even cover. But hey, man, we, we got to have you back hanging out with us, man. This has been fun. Hey, hey, man, I enjoyed it. I appreciate it. And uh, I was trying to hold back. I didn't, I'm trying to fill things out. I didn't want to be too <laughs> demonstrative on the show, but I appreciate you guys having me here, man. <laughs> yeah, this was fun, man. It's good stuff. No doubt. All right, everybody. We're going to be back for another one on Thursday. So so pop in, same time. I'll be promoting on Twitter and Facebook and, and so forth. Um, but uh, check us out. Last Dance Life Lessons. Peace out, everybody. Have a good week.